Welcome, everybody, to the Lighthouse Project. It's a special night on a Thursday night here, and um, we are very happy to have all you here today. We are very, very privileged tonight to bring over to the South Florida community Nisim Black. I think about it, I think about it. it's been about a year now since uh, I started listening to your music, and I know you've been doing this for a while now, but um, we pretty much play it all day long in my car. And um, it's, uh, for the last year, it's been a dream to, to, to bring you here to South Florida, to Miami, uh, to perform and to connect with everybody here and, and all your fans. And uh, one little thing that a lot of people don't know is that um, I got to know Nisim a couple months ago in Rosh Hashanah in Uman, and, um, and a little bit in Israel, and um, he's an amazing person, a, an incredible, amazing person, and, and uh, a very learned person, a person who takes his uh, Yiddishkeit very seriously and uh, makes uh, every possible effort to connect to God in, in, in many different ways and try to, uh, as, as they say, bring, bring kavod back to Hashem and using all his talents possible to make that happen. So um, I, we're blessed to have him here and uh, I really uh, am very excited for tonight's lecture and the concert on Sunday which is going to be amazing. So thank you very much for coming. Nisi Black, all you. How's everybody doing? Thank you guys so much. So uh, I've been talking for a long time. I, I probably should probably stay somewhere in front of this, but I'm not used to all the gizmos and gadgets, so We'll try to make it work. Jeez, how you doing, everybody out there? <laughs> so like Michael said, um, what a lot of people don't know though, this is my first time to Miami. So this is, this is my first time, I've never been here before. Um, over the past few years, I had a lot of threats, you know, but finally Michael followed through and actually brought me here. So, Mokashem, thank you guys so much. So it's like, I, as, I, as I always like to, I want to start with a little bit of a joke. Usually when you tell a person that it's a joke, it's not funny after they tell you, but uh, this one's funny regardless. There's, there's a man who was uh, who had season tickets, you know, to the Yankees. And uh, there was another guy walking by and he seen, he noticed this person and he said to him, you know, you have an empty seat right next to you. So the guy says to him, I keep the seat empty because this is the seat for my wife. My wife, when she was alive, she would sit here, but now that she's passed on in a memory, I leave the seat here open for my wife. And so the man turns to me and says, not your brother, maybe your father, somebody that's also very close to you can sit there in the seat. He said, they can't because they're all at the funeral. <laughs> so that empty seat represents, at least for all of us, a makom, a place where only a shim can feel, the only a void that Hashem put inside of every single one of us. And as a Ger of Nachman says, he asked the question of how is it possible that people could be Ger? How could it be that people that are so far away from Hashem can possibly wake up and all of a sudden start to reject their own religion and the only truth that they've ever known to come close to Yiddishkeit, which is so far, so distant from them. And another place he tells us, that every single person was put here in this world only to look for what it is that he lost in this world. The nitsutso, the sparks that a person lost in this world, what was it? I was put here for a reason, but for whatever reason, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm clueless as to what I was looking for. The whole foundation, the whole, the whole essence of a gear, and if anybody else is a gear in here, they, they understand what I'm saying is, always trying to figure out and find what was the point of that feeling of where I felt so distant, yet so close, but so far, trying to figure out why I don't feel like I belong. I feel like I'm out of my place. I had a moment like this when I was in the 10th grade. Now, apart from all the other facts I'm gonna share with you all tonight, you should also know 
that when I was young, even as a kid, I always felt that there was a God in the world. I felt that there was something significant, something greater than me. And I was safe to say, it's a spiritual kid. I asked a lot of deep questions, a lot of deep questions as a kid. Doesn't always reflect in all of my actions, but for sure, that's, uh, that's where I was. When I was, 10, when I was in the 10th grade, I was about 16 years old. I remember during the lunchtime, I remember walking into to the high school doors. And as soon as I got into the doors, just something all of a sudden hit me. It was like something out of the twilight zone or something. And I had this feeling come over me that, that, that in, in the way that I translated, at least said that I feel as if there's, this is only me. And I felt as if I didn't connect with anybody. I'm looking around with everybody, but I felt so out of place. I felt like that I knew something that maybe they didn't know. And I really didn't know what it was. And after I ate a chicken nugget, the feeling went away, or Christian. But at least the feeling, it was very, very impactful. And I never forgot about this feeling. To give you some of my background, my mother and my father, they were, rap they were both rappers. My mother was a hip hop, a hip hop artist and my father was a hip hop artist. It started right around 1981. So that's maybe two years after Rapper's Delight, which was the first rap song there was. And so, I really didn't have any other choice, you know what I mean? I could have probably been a janitor or something else, but uh, this is, was kind of inside of my blood. Along with that, my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family both were world-class musicians. They played with Quincy Jones, Ray Charles, uh, you know, Al Green's a distant, distant cousin, you know, I never met him before, but he's related to me on the black side. I don't know how the black got green or the green got green. But at least, you know, so in terms of music, I've always been in my heart. But that was by day and by night, both my mother and my father were also drug dealers. So this is the type of lifestyle. I could tell you when I would get off the bus, maybe 1995, 1994, I remember walking into my house and before even getting there, you see you know, dice games going on outside. This one's arguing with this one. These ones are going back and forth. Walking to the house, there's a table full of kilos of cocaine, just sitting there, right there. Garbage bags full of marijuana. This is before it was legal in Seattle. I still don't think that much is legal even now, but I don't know, maybe, maybe. But this was everyday life. And if anybody had asked me, I would have said, this is how everybody lives. This is, this is life for everyone. So I really didn't have a clue that there was something else. And I, myself, later on, like any good Jewish boy, also joined the family business. <laughs> started very young, started very young. I started smoking pot when I was nine years old. And I started selling already by the time I was 12 years old. I didn't really think it was that bad back then, but now you say it, it does sound pretty crazy, no? <laughs> but, you know, like I said, this is just life. And also to give you another, another interesting story, my grandfather, who had been very, very influential in my life, was a Sunni Muslim. So my first introduction to religion at all was Islam. It was the first religion I knew. My grandfather was a Sunni Muslim, and maybe he picked it up in prison. He also ended up back in prison, so that's, uh, you know, I don't know. Just between Mecca and prison, there's a lot of Muslims. I don't know what's going on. They asked me, there's some shaykhs there. I don't know. I think something's going on here. But my grandfather used to take me to mosque all the time when I was a young boy, and I prayed with him five times a day. He came to live with us. And apart from him being in my life, there was no other spiritual influence. All I had was my parents. And they lived a very secular lifestyle, obviously. And I had my grandfather. Now, when I was much younger, there were a few aunties and uncles there that would come and pick me up for Sunday school, and I would go to church there. But, you know, I didn't pay attention to what was going on. I was just there. So as far as any religion, at least first, that I would say that I was, I was a Muslim, because this is, this is what I knew. Shortly after this, my grandfather, as I mentioned, ended up in prison. And I had friends who I was very close with. And they, for a long time, were trying to get me into this hip-hop program that they were in. And every time I would push it off, i push it off, but eventually they went over. They knew that I was really into music. And so I decided to go to this program, and it happened to be at a place called the Union Gospel Mission. You can hear me? I'm, I'm, I'm loud enough? Oh. Let's make sure I don't have anything in my nose, because if my, <laughs> my wife gets a hold of this, I'm going to be in trouble. That's shit. We're gonna talk about this camera thing. This is too much. <laughs> anyway, so I finally found myself, you know, giving in and I went to this program 
Now this program was amazing because apart from the fact that it had everything I could desire as a young person wanting to have that outlet with music and, and, and with hip hop and everything else, apart from just that, these people were just like amazing and they were not normal. They were like healthy relationships. People like, you know, spoke to each other gently. It was like, you know, major culture shock. I'm looking at this and up until a point to where I thought everybody's house was like the way my house was. I was never exposed to these type of relationships and these type of, these type of people and individual, you know, these people, it was very weird for me. And I remember one day there was a counselor I have got very close to he came to me and he approached me. He had a lot of guts too, because I, I tell you why. He said to me, "We every year we do a camping trip, and we wanted to ask you if you would like to join us for camp." So I sat there and I quiet. I kind of looked at him, and I'm thinking to myself, "This guy, he's, he's not." I said, "Black people don't camp, like you know, what you, what you do <laughs> go camping." So I'm thinking to myself, "Go outside, sleep in a tent with bugs, wild animals, on purpose." <laughs> yeah. Black people don't camp, you know what I'm saying? So after this, he showed me this, this form and it had all the, you know, the Nixon and of what this camp was about. And I seen this was not a camp, this is a resort, this was a getaway, you know? So I ended up going to this place. And I have to tell you, for the eight days I was there, I was flying on cloud nine. For the first time, really, I got to be just a kid. I wasn't exposed to none of the nonsense that was going on at home. It was the most beautiful time I had for the eight days that I was there. And every night, there was one speaker, and the whole, the whole, the whole, entire, um, whole entire thing, the whole entire goal, this was a missionary camp, was to be able to missionize and to be able to get all the kids, the 500 some odd kids that were here at this camp, to become Christians. So every night, the speaker would go up, I remember the guy's name like it was yesterday, Bill Page, he would stand on the stage, and he would tell his life story on how he came to JC. And, and, in each, each day, it'd be a different part of the story. And he'd be leading up all the way up until on the eighth day, they're gonna do that altar call. Hashem would say, at least on the eighth day, we have simple star, we have that something else, they have altar call, okay? So on the eighth day, this altar call, before it happens, you have to understand that the way that everything worked, now, I was sitting in a room every night, and when they were asked the questions, we all go and discuss them. Well, other boys who I built a camaraderie with because we all were going through the same thing. We're all living in the same type of lifestyle and none of us had ever talked about it. None of us ever felt like anything was really wrong. We thought it was normal. Even all the pressure and all the anxiety of whatever that type of lifestyle can, can do to you, but it, it just, it was still normal. So to be able to talk about this in a, in a context where we were looking at these things and saying they're not normal and being able to rely on one, of, one another for strength, this was very, very life changing for me. And so by the time we got to that eighth day, right before the eighth day and this, and on that night, I remember I could barely sleep and something inside of me was just, you know, I, I don't know, I just, it was, it was just boiling inside in, in, in a good way. And I just had loads of questions. And so there was one, one counselor there that I got very close to. So I stayed up all night, almost, almost until the morning was till daybreak, asking questions on God and on heaven. And, and, and for every question that they had, they also had to answer, you know, what are you gonna be in your afterlife? All the, things I never thought about when I was 13 years old. So I had this discussion with this person. And so by the, by the, by the eighth day, I, I'm waiting, you know, I'm waiting. And when they do the altar call, I became a reborn again Christian, even though I wasn't a Christian before. I don't know how it works, it's a Kiddush. You could be a Christian, a reborn again Christian, even if you weren't a Christian. So I was reborn again, somehow. I don't know. There was no baptism over right there. They didn't have a mikvah there. But at least, whatever, I became a reborn again Christian. So after this, I was just like on fire. I became a Bible thumper. And I was so religious, I stopped cursing. I stopped hanging around all the friends that I was hanging around with, all the different knuckleheads and everything like that. And I was at least like, you know what I mean? you know, Mr. Christian and Mr. Holy for at least eight months. I was solid eight months that I, that was very, very strong. And this was very good for me because this was happening right as I was going into high school. Now I, I can, it's very hard to imagine what life would have been like if I didn't have this experience when I going into the high school, especially the high school that I went into. And along with that, I also had football. Football, I love football, American football. I don't have to say American football here because I'm in America, but uh, you know, sometimes some places they get it confused. So American football, real football. Um, I play football. Listen, the truth is they called it something else maybe before we started calling it football. So I was really in love with football. So I had that and 
my music also too was my my deepest passion was in my music i loved my music so much but then at the same time i love football so i was like juggling between these two things and all of a sudden also too i needed to be mr god mr godly man mr christian so i'm juggling all of this through high school and right around my 10th grade year i told you when i had that experience I entered into this elite Bible study group called the Crusaders. Back then, I thought they were good guys. It's okay. But uh, I was a crusader. I admit. I'm confessing. So I entered into this Bible study group. And I ranked up and ranked up. And eventually, as we started spreading out and doing more, more missionary work into the, in the community, it wasn't long before I had like half of my high school coming to the Young Gospel Mission. All the clubs, all the activities, the programs. And I became the poster child for the Union Gospel Mission. If you were going to the stores, if you were driving on the billboards, all the private Catholic uh, uh, universities, I was in their magazines. It was like a big thing. I was moving up, and they gave me a junior missionary card, so I have smicha, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so after my smicha and everything that was going on there with this, uh, with this, with this, with this program, it was almost as if, like you know. Things really couldn't get better, so people were talking to me, you know, about uh, joining a church, and it was very, very hard for me at this time because I'm like thinking to myself, like, listen, I'm here at this place almost five days a week, and I'm giving my all. I'm bringing so much, so many different people, and even during the summers, I dedicated my summers to helping out and and and, and into missionary work and going to build orphanages in, in Mexico and different things. Like that. So this is what I dedicate. You want me to give up my, my, my Sunday Sunday football to go to church? You know what I mean? I'm like looking at these people. Are you serious? As much as I dedicate to you know to God already, He wants also one Sunday. So after maybe my tenth grade year, I ran into or it was sort of brought to me the 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 woman of my dreams, which is my wife, Hashem. So my wife, who I, Hashem, everything, I, I give everything to her. I live in Yerushalayim with four kids. We have four kids together. Hashem, this all started from the 10th grade of high school. Hashem. So I ran into my wife, and this is how I knew that she was the one for me. Right? We talked, and we talked, and we talked. And it just so happened that a really, another close friend of mine, he was so close to my family that he'd be at my house even if I wasn't there. You know, he's like that type of friend. He's so close, they treat him also like he's one of the kids. And he came and he was dating this girl. And this girl had a sister. And so they came over to my house and it was just me and her. So we're talking and talking and talking while he's, you know, whatever. And then after that, the way I tell the story, she couldn't stop thinking about me and this whole other thing. That's not, that's how it <laughs> She'd probably tell a different story, but that's the way I tell it at least. And so... After we're, we're done talking and everything, and I'm just like, you know, I tell my friend, I tell Robert, and I'm like, you know, that girl, she was amazing, and, and I want to talk to her, can I talk to her again, or whatever. So he invites me, if you know, you want to talk to her, if you really want a chance, you got to come to church. So, now, here's the litmus test, you know, because this said, listen, football, Sundays, church, just doesn't go together. I love God on every other day of the week, but on Sunday, it's, it's time for football. So... When I asked them, you know, okay, whatever, the details and everything like that, it comes to find out she was a seven-day Adventist, church was on Saturday. I said, she's the one. <laughs> Good show. She's the one. Okay, sure. So you have napkins there, Michael? It's okay. And so, after that... And ultimately, I tell you even now, my wife saved my life. She's such a, such a good girl and such a, such a support for me. Broke Hashem, like I said, even till today, I, I wouldn't have been able to do anything without him. Shortly after this, my wife also, she, she got very close to my, uh, to my mother. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and right around the time, in my 11th grade year, going into my, going into my, uh, my senior year of high school, a demo of mine had made it to the desk of an A&R at Virgin Records. So all of a sudden, I'm starting to get calls from this from this A and R. And as psyched as I am about football and everything else, now I have the opportunity in my real dream with music. And so now I'm talking to this A and R. And one of the things about the hip hop industry and with the music industry just in general is they're never really they're never looking to create something new. They always want something that's already out and whatever's hot, they just kind of want to jump in line to what's ever there. And say you know, take sometimes a brave guy in A and R to say I'm going to go and take a shot with something different. That was not always the case. So this individual that I was talking to, he told to me that uh, he told me that uh, what was big in hip hop right now is a guy by the name of Fifty Cent. Okay, obviously most people, I'm sure none of you guys know who he is. 
So he was very, very huge. And what 50 Cent sort of did, if anybody had been paying attention to the industry at that time, especially in the hip hop world, gangster rap was kind of out. It wasn't that, you know, Ja Rule was singing, LA was singing. There was like a, there was a, there was a lot of pop going on inside of rap right there. And one of the things that he did is he brought back this hard and this, this, you know, this, this gangster rap, this, you know, back, you know, people start killing each other again on, on songs, you know, with him. So. That was one of the things they asked me. They said, well, you know what? Your style, you're sending in, you're not cursing. You're not, so maybe you could rough it up. You could pepper it in with a few words, different things like that. You know, at least we just want to hear you this way to see if it's a, whatever, it's a good fit. And I told them, no, I'm, you know, junior missionary. I have smicha. I can never talk uh, in this type of manner. You know, I have values. I'm a Christian. I have values. I, you know, that's, that's, that's what I told them. So shortly after this, they sent over via fax back then. Yeah, people used fax back then. They sent over by fax a tentative offer. And on the tentative offer, had half a million dollars on there. And I start cursing. Very, very fast. <laughs> very, very fast, you know? And so I'm sending in these new demos and different things like that. And uh, at this time, too, it was, a, it was a very monumental time for me because I, I just graduated high school. Now, I know that's like nothing for some people because everybody expects, okay, you, of course you do that, then you go on to college and all that. Like, in the hood, we're just trying to get the guy out of high school, okay? So for me, I just graduated high school. I'm at the, the, you know, I'm at the top of my game. The music thing is happening. My demos are, you know, are spreading. I'm having this talk with this, with this A&R. And there was one particular night that I had said I was going to stay up all in the studio. I declared all night, I'm going to pull all night in the studio. And my mother at this time was addicted to narcotics. She was addicted to pain medication. And I had already seen, you know, for several years, my mother fall asleep, wake up, fall asleep, wake up, fall asleep, wake up. But this one particular day that I declared I was going to be in the studio all night, I kept running up to see my mother really like out, out, out. And I kept on waking her up, and, and I finally went to go put her in the bed. And I remember on the phone with my, my girlfriend, who's my wife, and that was my girlfriend back then. I have a, always have a problem trying to figure out how to say this, you know. I don't want it to sound like I have two, a girlfriend and a wife, but my, my wife. And I said to her, I said, you know, one day I feel like I'm going to go and try to wake her up, and she's not going to wake up. And surely the next morning my mother didn't wake up. And I was in the studio recording, and I remember my, my stepfather and my, and my sister coming down, and their faces were so cold, they couldn't even, you know, and the pain afterwards that I felt after that, I wouldn't have wished it on my worst enemy. Because by this time, after graduation, and after I was, you know, almost out of my parents' care, I guess at least, me and my mother had become best friends. So to see her, you know, cold like that, and so it was very, very hard on me, but it did open up doors in another way. I have an auntie. I love dearly, and she happens to be very wealthy, but she keeps it to herself. And she, 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 she took pity on me. She asked me, she said to me, I know you're into the music. What can I do to help you? So I was working with a certain manager at that time. He said that the best thing to do is we can fly to New York. You have some interest from this record label. Let's go meet with other big record labels and see if we can get a bit of war going on. And bidding wars, obviously, if I have interest here and I show that I've interest there, then maybe I can get another label to out-offer the next, next label. So after this, we flew to New York, and I met with Slim Shady Records. I met with Atlantic. I met with Dame Dash Music Group, which was right after the Rockefeller split before Dame Dash and, and Jay-Z. And there, I met with a guy by the name of Clark Kent. Clark Kent was responsible for finding both Biggie Smalls and Jay-Z. And I spent two days with him, and he was very, very into my music and he was very very excited and he wanted to sign me and a conference call went happened the next morning and nothing went through dame dash said he didn't want to and thank god anyway because that company collapsed but that's what happens probably because they didn't sign me back then it was a no-brainer <laughs> so that's what happened so now i'm stuck because by the time i get back to seattle also to the interest we had from Virgin and also Fickle. So what do we do? Now I have this harder persona and I have about maybe at, by this time 15, 16 songs already. I'm, I have a record full of this. And what happened also too is I started making the music, right? Roughing it up, toughing it up a little bit. Slowly but surely the, the, the guys that were around me also too, you know, were also rougher. And you know, a lot of guys I stopped hanging around with all of a sudden they're back in my inner circle. And so now I found myself back into this place that was very far away from, you know, Bible study, junior missionary. This was not the place that I was in. 
And so we decided that we just released the music independently. We started our own independent record label and we put things and we put it out on our own and we went up and down whatever the coast and whatever selling CDs being kicked out in the malls and every, every, everything like that, soliciting. And it wasn't long before that, you know, you're going to start catching interest from bigger places and bigger people and magazines and the, and, the, and the local press and things like that. And along with success also comes haters. And there was one particular artist, which was always, which was also big at that time in music, was that, you know, these diss tracks where one rapper would disrespect you, say the most disrespectful thing you can about another guy to attract attention to yourself. So one guy decided that he would make a song about me. And so I'm already thinking, planning my return song and different things like that. And I consult with my chevra there at the time. And they said, you know, that's not a good idea. They said, if we just go beat the guy up, he won't make any more songs. This is a very simple <laughs> equation here, you know? And so that's what we decided. So we ended up finding ourselves at a nightclub. We had found out through our intelligence where he was going to be. And we found him and we got into a brawl right there, all out in the, uh, in the, in the streets, right outside the, right outside the club. And after that, we split our own ways, and we all heard sirens, everybody ran. And in the city, we had our own independent record label, our, our, our own office. So I went into the office with the guys just to cool down, you know, debrief, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, my phone starts ringing. I get a call. And the call is from a producer, a local guy that I knew. And he said to me that the police were looking for me. So I'm thinking to myself, well, the police look at, you know, because I fight outside a club. Everybody fights outside of clubs. It's like it's in all the movies, you know, everybody knows everybody fights outside the club. What's the, what's the hit? The police are looking for me because of that. And he said, no. He said, actually, they said that you had a gun and you were shooting at the club and all this. So now, obviously, there's an exaggerated story. But again, I grew up in the hood. You, I, I ran anyway. I was, you know, I was afraid. You know, and so many times I'm driving down the street fully, I'm going to speed limit with insurance and you know, I have everything and I'm still afraid that the police are behind me. The lights aren't even on, you know? So this guy telling me the police are looking for me because I had a gun, I ran, I'm almost ran. And I remember busting through the gates, through the, through the doors. And I see on the side of the building, the police lights flickering off the, off the, off the walls. And so, I look down and I see from a distance, this is, this is far away, they're not there for me. So I start walking and I got close and close and I seen all of a sudden they had somebody surrounded. And they had dogs, they had guns, they had the whole thing. And it turned out to be a really close friend of mine. He went up to go kill the guy after I left. Boko Shem, he missed. He was a horrible shot. He shot everything except for the guy. He shot the car, the poles, the fire hydrants, the bricks, everything except for the guy. But at the time, I'm thinking to myself, that's the worst thing he could have did was that he missed because it had every appearance that I sent him after him to go kill him. So now what do you think these guys are thinking? They're going to have to come take me out. And I'm thinking the opposite, that if I don't go and kill this person, then he's going to come and kill me. So in these moments, the Shim has his ultimate way of design that... I found out who I really was. And all of a sudden, you can only imagine, I became religious again very quick. And I was crying out to Hashem day and night crying because this wasn't who I was. This wasn't the type of person that I wanted to be, a person that lived this type of life. So I grew up with guys like this. I've been in these, these type of situations, but with, with other people, I've been around people that have had these type of situations, but to actually have it myself, to be worried that my life is in danger the moment that I leave out of my house wasn't for me. So during this time, I'm praying, I'm praying, and Hashem performed for me an ace. He performed a miracle. What happened? On the third day, my praying and all of my supplications and my praying to God. By this time, I was a Christian, not Hashem. I was praying to God, whatever. And I was praying and I'm praying, and all of a sudden, I have a, I have a call, and it's from the other guy. And I'm telling you, it's from a because nobody would ever call a person and ask them if you're trying to kill them. It's just not the call you get in the hood. Nobody calls... I was just wondering, perhaps, maybe you were trying to kill me. I'm, you know, it's not a call that you get. So when I see that the guy called me, I'm thinking automatically, this, this is from God. God gave me this opportunity to squash his beef. So I talked to him, and we squashed everything. I told him the whole situation or whatever, and that was one thing. But there was a second beef that I had. The same guy that decided to pull the trigger that night and, and shoot at this guy, and it was a horrible shot. His record was just released on our independent label. And guess who did the fundraising? I did. Where did I do the fundraising? Other drug dealers. 
<laughs> so now I have no way to even recoup the money because this guy is in prison. So now I have two things. Now I got one thing out of the way. These guys are not looking for me, but what do I do about the guys that I owe the money to? So you can imagine I did every legal thing, every illegal thing, every illicit thing, whatever I could do to get the money back, which really, really, really was very, very, it was a, it was a struggle. It was a struggle, but I did do everything I could and I paid the money back. And after that, it was like, I was mommish in the clear. I was in the clear. And the one thing that didn't stop, at least, I was, I never stopped crying out to God. I was praying to God. This is long before I knew anything about breast love. Or not. I was just crying, crying, crying to Hashem. And it was, wasn't long until I started to think. And I remembered myself when I was in, when I was in those Bible study groups, when I was junior missionary. And I had all these questions. And nobody ever gave me sufficient answers for the questions that I had. Nobody ever answered them for me. And I wanted to know things that were very, very simple. Like, you know, which religion came first? Uh, was Islam? You'd be surprised at how much Christians are not, because, because the, the, the limud is not really, it's not very strong by them. It's much more on the, on the feeling of things and how things make me feel and how I, you know, interpret things for myself and how, how this, you know, what it means to me. People don't know that, you know, Judaism was first, Islam came after Christianity. They don't know really those lines. And I asked another question. I said, if JC was Jewish, how come Christians aren't Jewish? I don't understand. So I would ask these type of questions, different questions, also things that I was reading at the time, like I said, because I was a Bible thumper. There wasn't nothing that was getting past me, and I would ask. And, you know, so to have faith and different things like that. So I would ask these questions, but they were never there. So now for the first time, I'm alone, and nobody's there to answer my questions. So I went to the best rabbi that I could possibly find. If anybody's ever heard me speak, they know exactly which rabbi I'm talking about. No disrespect to any rabbis in here, because yeah, I'm sure you have something you do. This one's just better. His name is RabbiGoogle.com. RabbiGoogle.com. Because Shem is an excellent, excellent pulse in anything you want to know. Any type of question you have, you can ask RabbiGoogle.com. And so I started going on Google. And my whole mission was there is that I wanted to find what was at the showish, what was at the root of Christianity, right? Because I needed to now dig it up because I wanted to find out why do I believe what I believe? What's the, what's the whole, what's, what's, what's this all about? And so I started to search and slowly but surely, like I'm ordering books now, I have a JPS to knock and a humash and I'm, and my, and you know, for my wife, as far as she concerned, half is English, half is hieroglyphics. You don't know what's going on inside these pages in the books. And I didn't know either, but I figured at least if I got a Jewish copy of these books, then it at least would have, uh, the, the translation would at least be authentic. So I'm there and I'm telling you, I'm spending maybe eight hours a day there and I'm crying and I'm going through and I'm saying, and my wife, she had no idea what was going on. And we were newlyweds by this time, we were already married. I was 20 years old when I married my wife. I've always been a chassid, told you, always been a chassid. So, but I got married at 20. So my wife, she has no idea what's going on. She's just like hoping at least I'm not becoming a Muslim. You know, she, she's like, you know, that was her, that was only not. And I finally, after all my research and sitting there and I, one day, I sat my wife down on the couch and I made sure I sat on one that was very far away from her just in case anything went flying across the room. I sat on the couch and I told her, I said, "Hun, I don't want to celebrate Christmas anymore. Don't want to celebrate Easter. She said, I don't want to be married, you know. And so after this though, together, we started to work through things. She was very upset initially. And, 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 and this upset, and she was upset with me at first. And then she went to go and learn and different things like that. And she reviewed all the things that I've been learning. I wrote, I took very thorough notes and, 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 and I put all the sources of everything that I was getting and what book it was or what, or what website I had seen it from, whatever. And one day she came to me she was still upset. She wasn't upset with me. She was upset with the shin. And she said, I feel like I've been lied to my whole entire life. And why did a shim allow this to happen to me? Why did it, why did it allow it to happen to me? Now she knew a little bit about Sabbath already because she was a seven day Adventist. So she at least knew to some degree that this was Hashem's day, whether or not she really did anything about it or not. But now all of a sudden we're thinking it's Shabbat. And we just read, you're not allowed to work on Shabbos. You know, Nehemiah, he's screaming at everybody. They're bringing money inside to get, you're not allowed to work on Shabbos. So what do we do? So I broke Hashem. I stopped doing the dishes on Saturday. <laughs> broke Hashem. That, was, that was my whole thing over there. I said, because you can't work the greasy pots for sure. I'm done on Saturday. No pots. Broke Hashem. So everything we're trying to figure out what to do. And we, we felt like Mamish were on an island on our, uh, of our own. We didn't know what to do. 
And my wife, at this time, she's very, very close with her sister. And this is very weird because most brothers and sisters and sisters, they fight. And then my wife and her sister were like, you know, they're very, very tight. And so she would come over all the time. And at the time, her sister was dating my best friend since kindergarten. And so her sister also, too, she started to see what was going on with us and seeing the changes. And so my wife would talk to her often. And also, too, and then eventually it was my best friend. And now it's four of us, and we're all on island. We're all, everybody's not doing dishes on Shabbos now, you know what I'm saying? And so we're trying to find, just looking for the truth. And maybe we believe this, and, and, and JC, okay, maybe he's Messiah, but he's not. And so we ended up at this Messianic congregation, all of us. That was the first one to go. I remember I went, the first time I went there was on Pesach, even. And I walked into this place. Right? Not knowing really anything about Judaism per se. And the last thing I'm looking for at this point is another religion. Because I just found out the one I thought to be true was false. So I'm, that's the last thing I'm looking for. So I walk inside this place. And there's people, you know, shuckling on stenders. It's a messianic place. It's not, you know, beautiful on Kodesh. I didn't know what it was. They read now a for Torah. There's somebody <laughs> shuckling on, the, on this. And all the tefillah, all the, the davening was out of an uh, arts grocery door. Right? So I walk into this major culture shock already, and I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what disease makes a person do this? Five <laughs> seconds, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's got, uh, you know, sheets on, you know. So, so I'm sitting there trying to, you know, act comfortable, you know. And after they read from the Haftar, they read from the New Testament. And I was like, okay, at least I know this. I know this one right here. And so eventually we all came in. We were coming there. We started coming to the classes there. And we are there for about two years. And it was like nothing I can do, nothing that I can ever change. And I think we still even have the same, I wouldn't say it's a problem, it's actually a very beautiful thing. But it's a very, very interesting how you can type in anything, J, anything Jewish on, 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 you know, online and Chabad.org comes up. You know, I don't know if anybody else has the same problem, but that's like what was happening to me. But no matter what I typed in, Michael Jackson, it was preferably Chabad.org came up. This is what was going on. So meanwhile, I'm here and I'm going there and I'm now going on classes and now I have an internet Rebbe. Also, I got to meet and one of the beautiful things about after, you know, some people say, oh, you're famous, you know. I like to give people nafas. So one of the things I do is like if there was somebody that affected me during that time, I like to go and meet the rabbi today and tell him, listen, you know, I, I want to let you know you were very, very instrumental in, in my tshuva and, and I like to let you know. So one of the rabbis on there, his name was Rabbi Mendo Kaplan. Is a rabbi of Chabad uh, Flamingo. I think he taught me how to put on a towel. It's all type of stuff I learned from him online. So I went to go tell him, listen, you were my internet rabbi, at least for the first two years or whatever during my tshuva. He didn't know. And so that was what I was doing. I was on Chabad.org. And so after that, I started to actually learn. And all of a sudden, we started learning the beauty of, of, of Kashrus. And we learned that there was a little bit more to Shabbos apart from, you know, not doing the dishes. Actually, could do the dishes, but after I found that out, I was like so upset. You know what I mean? <laughs> but whatever. So, so now I'm finding out new things, and things are starting to be. I'm starting to be enlightened, if you, if you will. And 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 I found myself somewhat in the crossroads while I was trying to find the truth, and I felt like. All of a sudden, I got to a place where I didn't know who God was at all. And everything that I thought I knew about God, now I have to hit a reset button. Because now, I'm trying to find the truth. And at this time, what I failed to mention is that I didn't only take, you know, the, 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 the JPS Tanakh or the Art Scroll, Art Scroll, Art Scroll uh, Humash. I also had a Quran. I was searching through everything because I wanted to know, I wanted to know the Amos. I wanted to know the truth. And I found myself, like, just broken one day. And I told Hashem, I said, listen... We're going to start from the beginning, and I'm going to read the Bible from cover to cover. And I want to look for only just a few things. What's your character? What do you love? What do you hate? What do you reward? What do you punish? I just want to know who you are, because obviously, I shared my thought I knew you, but now I feel like I don't know who you are. So that's what I did. I read, I read Tanakh. From cover to cover, back to back. And I was only looking for that in Hashem, and I can't begin to tell you. Along with that, and crying at Tefillah. I was fasting every every day. I know it don't look like it, but I was fasting <laughs> every every week, three days in a row, and I was going out crying to Hashem. This is still all before knowing anything about tefillah. He's both of us. I was going out crying to Hashem, and it wasn't like it was every single day 
that I was just on fire. I felt the fire. I felt that Hashem was with me. I felt that God was with me. And it was no shortage of every, especially time I was most inefficient in, in, in the fasting and in the tefillah, that I felt like there was gilui. There was some type of revelation that Hashem was opening me up to something else. And I was coming closer and closer and closer to the truth. And so after two years of being at this place, I seen that where I was, hashkafically in this other place, a messianic place, I didn't even have to get into anything so theological. All I seen is that this was further and further and further away from the authenticity that I was chasing in the whole, in the whole beginning. It was far away. And it all came to a head like this. For the first time in Seattle, they were having this national messianic congregation get together thing and, and this is going to be the first time it's in seattle why they chose it i don't know it doesn't do anything but rain there broke we have beautiful summers but it rains a lot so they chose to do it in seattle this year and so one of the things they told us before this this conference is going to come and all these congregations from la new york everybody it's, it's supposed to be a big thing in a hotel whole thing one of the things they told us was as they warned us they said there's going to be orthodox rabbis in the lobby and whatever you do don't talk to them, don't say hi, don't wish them a Shabbat Shalom, don't, you know, like, you know, how we say about a missionary, it's like the opposite left, you know, they turn it around, don't say nothing because they're only trying to take you away from JC, that's all they want to do. So at Rosh Hashem, we decided, me and my brother-in-law, that we will go to the conference, and instead of going in, we spend the four days outside with the rabbis they told us not to talk to, so that's what we did <laughs> for the four days, because Rosh Hashem, apart from Rabbi Google, I had real rabbis I could talk to, you know. So one of the rabbis' name was Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Michael Skobak. He's the educational director for Jews for Judaism in Toronto. Another rabbi was a Chabad rabbi from uh, Australia, Rabbi Ellie Cohen, which he sort of calls himself the black sheep because it's not really a Lubavitch thing, but whatever. They chase around these, these, these congregations. And the, the, the insightfulness and the, and the enlightenment that we received from talking to these guys for those four days was just, it was, it was phenomenal. It was life-changing. And I remember that, like I said, it wasn't anything that I had to get into theology. That all came afterwards that I started to really look at and be able to, 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 un, to undo the thing that when you say everything could be covered up with faith, that I start to actually think about some of the nonsense that I believe. But at this time, it wasn't nothing, it wasn't something theological. It was all heart. It was all neshama. And I felt that after reading now, nah, back to back, and going through all the field, that one of the things that happens, I always say like this, if you put two people together, you have two good friends, right? Eventually, if they spend time and they communicate with each other, every single day they begin to resemble each other. And it's, and it's an amazing phenomenon, because even I see it today, sometimes people start looking like their dog. If they spend too much time with the dog, you know what I'm saying, they start also start looking alike. So it's a very interesting thing. But if you take two good friends and you start putting these two people together, and they're talking every day, and, and, and sometimes you get to a point where if you have a mutual friend, you can barely even tell them apart, even on the phone. It's an interesting thing. It's a phenomenon that happens. So I, I seen for myself, the more and more time I was spending with Hashem, and the more and more time that I was giving myself over, and I was being most nefesh, the more and more I began to love the things that Hashem loved. And one of the things that a person cannot escape, if you're reading Nach, and you read inside the Navi, you see the love that Hashem has for the Jewish people. And once a person finally hops and he gets out of his separation or his, uh, his replacement theology that Christianity has, and he realizes, this is not talking about me, this is talking about Jews. And I'm very, very jealous. Hashem, what's going on here? And from that, I wanted in. I seen inside of there the love that Hashem, even after the Tokacha, all the rebuke that he put on Claudius, he's, he's warming them up with the most beautiful words that Hashem would never leave. He would never leave the Jewish people. So it became very, very clear to me that the whole entire integrity of the Torah, the whole entire integrity of all of Nath and all of Torah is based upon the Jewish people and their existence. Meaning to say, I'm going to say this, it's going to sound very weird, but I came to the conclusion that if there's no Jewish people, there's no Hashem, because his whole entire integrity is there. Now, if there's no Jewish people in the world, we can say that every single thing was wrong, because all, but all the promises of, of Hashem, I'm seeing it over and over again, and there's no bigger band, or no bigger group of people that are more owned in on eschatology than Messianic people. They're like, that's like what they live for. But it was no escape that at the end, and by everybody's book, this is not only only by, it's not only by a Torah, it's not only by the Nah. In the Hadiths, Muhammad, he has to have a war with the Jews at the end. And by the Christianity, as I said, the Jews have to be here for the seven years of tribulation and the whole rapture. Uh, the, we have to be in the story. So Hashem's whole entire day, and this was inside of me, like I'm telling you, I was a mom's burning. So I had a love for, for Claudius Yisrael. 
And I started to explain this to the Rabbi Michael Skolbach in different ways, and I and I asked this question. Rabbi Eli Cohen said something to me like this, because I was wondering, what's the what's the problem? Okay, maybe look at this, maybe he is Messiah, maybe he's not, or whatever. What does it matter? Why can't I just be a Jew? Why can't I just? And he said to me, very powerful words. He said, you know the story of Ruth. And I said, hey, of course I know the story of Ruth. Come on, I've been through Tanakh a couple of times, you know, I know this for sure. And he said to me, just as she said, your God is my God. And your people are my people. So each gear in his own personal way has to be able to say those words to God. And for each person is different. And he said, for you, it's that ultimately I will accept what the Jewish people accept. And I will reject anything that the Jewish people reject. That's very, very clear. After that, I never went back to the place. And for, for at least the next two months we were there, we were davening inside of my, inside of my living room. And, you know, whatever, every, every Shabbos, it was me, my brother-in-law, and by this time, there was another family we were also very close to. They didn't go back. And so we're sitting inside my living room, we're diving and things like that. And my wife had already, by this time, she came to me and she said, I want an Orthodox conversion. This is what I want to do, this one. And I'm just like, okay, you know, there's only one problem, you know. I never seen any black Jews. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, broke a shim, I, I'm happy, I'm excited, but I just, I still never seen any black Jews, you know. So still that, you know, that, that, and, and the Shem arranges everything the way that he needs to and at the time that he needs to. As Arab Shabbos, I was checking out groceries and a self-checkout or whatever. And by this time, I was already going with Kippah, Tzitzit, me and my wife. We already were eating only kosher. We were, we were keeping Shabbos. I was only, you know. And, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, in between the groceries, I just heard, you know, it was like a light went off. I heard, Shabbat Shalom, brother, you know. <laughs> And I turn around, it's a black Jew. And he's standing inside the thing. And he's like, you know, he's cheesing. You know what I mean? He's cheesing at me. I start cheesing at him. We're like, you know, I start to talk. And I started to tell him a little bit about my journey. And he invited me for Shabbos. So the first time I went to Shabbos was his, from his house. And what I failed to mention before, that's very important now, is that I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. And I didn't know anything about Judaism. But my, my good friend there, he was a block away from my, from my childhood house that I grew up in. So I was over his house by Shabbos, and I'm having an amazing time. And then all of a sudden, on the way, I think maybe the second time on the way to his house, I ran into another guy in a used bookstore who was also, he was also Jewish, and he also invited me for Shabbos. So now we're getting invited for Shabbos, and everybody's so warm and, and, and very nice. And, and all of a sudden, you're like, you know, we're, we're serious about this thing. We want to do it, and we, and we want, and so before we could ever start the actual process, we had to move inside of the community. That was like the, that was the way that the rabbis, at least there they do it. They, they won't take you as a serious candidate for conversion unless you move into the community because they don't know what's going on if you like live very, very far away anyway. So whatever, I don't know whatever the catch point is. So that's what we did. We looked and my wife found a place and it was just for some odd reason that Jews like have this problem of living in places that's just like too expensive to live in for a person who's just like, you know, if you... So my wife, the only way that we can make it work, my wife found a house that was big enough for both families, me and my, and my, uh, my in-laws. And they would take the downstairs and we would take the upstairs. And so we ended up finding this house and it was like, like that. Everybody was just like, you guys moved in already? It's like that quick, you know? So we ended up moving to this house and we had the upstairs, they had the downstairs, but there was a middle floor and on the middle floor was the kitchen. And I don't care how much two people love each other. It, it just doesn't matter. Two women in the same kitchen just doesn't work. You can ask Avraham Avinu, Yaakov Avinu. I mean, it just doesn't work. There's no, no signs of this ever working. No matter if they're sisters even. So we like, along with this, our families kept growing. So we already had one child each. And, and both the sisters, you know, just like a month apart or something like that, or maybe a couple months apart, got pregnant. And so now we're, and so now we're already thinking, you know, maybe this is time. And then one day the rabbi, that was our sponsor rabbi, he came to me, this rabbi Benzikin, one of the sweetest guys, he's become like family for us. Rabbi Benzikin, he calls us into the office and he tells us, sit down, listen, I'm going to tell you guys something. He said, you guys, <clears throat> as much as you love each other, you're two separate families. And if one of you convert first, converts first, there's going to be a problem with maybe kashrus if this one cooks inside the kitchen, or what about the yamin tovim if it's Pesach and one family's Jewish and other isn't. So he had to sort that out, and we never thought about this. So he said the best idea is for you guys to move into separate homes. And so we did that. We moved into a new place, and my brother and sister-in-law stayed there. And so fast forwarding a bit, the time came for us to go to the Beit Din. Now, my family went first, 
and we went in to meet with the rabbis, and it was we were interrogated, Rav Hashem, and it was a very, very like you know, you know, one of those moments you're like shaking, you don't know what's gonna what's gonna be, you're gonna go meet even some of the rabbis you may have met here and there and all that, but when you come and sit at that table, everybody means business, you know what I mean? It's very, very serious, and for some odd reason they liked us, you know. And after we were done, you know, the, the, there was uh, my brother and sister-in-law, they also had their date scheduled, but it was going to be for like another month. It was going to be another month before they went in to, to go see the rabbis. And we knew the person who worked this, she was the secretary, so she did all the scheduling for all the candidates or whatever. So all of a sudden, something happens like crazy in Kashrus, and the rabbis need to have an emergency meeting. This is only a few days after my meeting. So she says, well, if they're going to meet anyway, so we might as well move up the next candidates. So my brother and sister-in-law, they also go in. And the rabbis, they like them also. So the Abbe Din, he calls the rabbi, Rabbi Vindekin, and he says, we have to do both families together. That's the only way it's going to work. So the next time we had a meeting, it was all four of us uh, standing before the rabbis, and we all talked to them. And the Beit Din sat then and said, okay, so we do everything together. And shortly after this, two months later, we had a double wedding and a double, double dip. I always say double dip. Don't double dip usually in chips, but we all dipped on the same day, Rosh Hashem, and we had a double wedding, and the wedding was the most beautiful wedding. The community came together and put together like a mass. We wouldn't even think of maybe a few friends or something like that, Rosh Hashem, but they put together a massive wedding for both of us. And Baruch Hashem, we all went on to live happily ever after. Me and my brother and sister-in-law and my, and my wife, all of us, we made Aliyah Baruch Hashem to Yerushalayim almost two years ago. And that's the story, and we'll have questions and answers after this. Baruch Hashem. Thank you so much. <laughs> Rabbi Michael, would you help me facilitate the questions, please? How did I get connected to Bressa? How did I know you were going to ask that question? I, I don't know. Something made me think that uh, you'd be the one to ask me that question. All right, you guys have time for another story. So, one of the things that happened, I see a lot by Baal Chuvas and a lot of Garim, is that if you have, you know, a, if, if there's a couple, there's usually one couple, one person in the couple moving faster than the other. Sometimes it's the woman, sometimes it's the man. Uh, our particular case, it was me. And I was moving much faster than my wife. And, and that, that obviously creates a lot of shalom bias issues. They're like, listen, I'm ready for this. I'm not ready for this. You ready for this? I'm not ready for this. And I remember relaying this over to one of the rabbis that was there inside the community. I told him, you know, I want to move faster and, I, and this is where I was and things like that. And he handed me a book and he also handed the same book to my brother-in-law. It was The Garden of Peace by Rabbi Arush. And I read that book. And it changed everything. It was like voodoo. It was like magic. You know what I'm saying? As soon as I started reading this book, and I started doing tefillahs, like, you know, I only crying when I'm reading the book. This is like the greatest musa in the world. But I started seeing change my marriage and change my wife. And it was like so shocking what was happening. I put the book down. I like really. I thought it was magic. And and after that, I had a good friend in the community, Uncle Rick, Rick Eskenazi who handed me the Garden of Amuna and the Garden in Forest Fields. You see, we were already reading that book, and he said, if you like this, then check out these two. And so I started reading that. And so for the first, you know, at least year or whatever of, of even my, my process, this is shortly after we moved into community, or before even. And so by the time we moved in, I was already Rav Arushed up, you know what I mean, by this, by this point. And after I started reading these books, they announced that Lisa Brody was going to be coming to, to, to town to Seattle, to Seattle for the first time. So, obviously, I went to the dinner, and it was something about it. We just, we just made it. It was just a Kesha that we seen each other, we locked eyes, and it was like love at first sight. Not the same way with my wife, but it was a different rabbi student love, you know. And, and so he told me to keep in touch with him. So I did. I kept in touch with him over, over email, over, over, over a course of a year or so, and we stayed in touch. And um, shortly after this, I, uh, I started watching also two lectures online from another Breslov guy who was also connected with Rav Arush. And so I had, after the Garris, it was a good friend of ours named, by the name of Larry Rusak. He probably doesn't like to be named, but he offered, he offered like the, the dream of a lifetime. You don't know how long I was praying for this, but he offered us our first trip to Eretz Israel. And this was like his, his gift to us for, from our wedding. 
And so he took us there to Israel, and that was like the first thing I'm thinking about. I was like, I gotta go meet Rav Arush, you know what I mean? And Hashem works in a mysterious way because what happened was our stop first was in New York because I had a few different meetings I need to make in New York, and I would meet uh, meet up with them, and then we all go to Israel. Rav Arush, at the same time I got to New York, was coming to New York for his first time. So I met him and Laser Brody there inside of uh, in, in New York in uh, oh, Ohad Sedek. It was a uh, Syrian synagogue. Um, and and it's like you can't imagine how many people were there. Now, I already were waiting for the longest time that you can imagine. Was, I think the thing started at maybe 7 o'clock. Here it goes. It's getting close to 9.30. Still no Rav Arush, no Rav Brody. Everybody's worried. And then message came in. Ali Mansour and Rav Arush out for dinner. And it's taking a little longer. And like everybody's like sitting there waiting. And all of a sudden he comes in and he's dancing and he's dancing and him and Rob Brody are dancing. And I'm telling you, like, we're like at the, at the, at the, almost to the door. And all of a sudden Rabbi Brody stops and he looks down and he, go, he sees me and he goes, and I'm like, how'd he spot me? And my friend's like, I don't know. How'd he see me? Out of all these people here, Rabbi Brody see me? You know, and I think... Okay, whatever. Later on, I thought about it. Okay, whatever. But, Lisa, he stopped me. So I'm up there and I'm dancing with Rav Arush or whatever. And Lisa Brody told him my story and whatever. And Bokushim gave the most beautiful bracha and whatever. And it was, it was a cashier. And then the next week, we all were back in Israel. And I got to see the Rav again. And he invited me from Malava Malcha at his house. He says, I'm like flying on cloud nine. And we went out. One night to go do Hebrew to do a good friend of mine took us out to, to the Kever Yehuda Zev level, which is one of Rabbi Arush's Rabs, he's one of the Lama Vavi, maybe he's, he's a big tzaddik. So we had this Kever, whatever, and I remember like just feeling on cloud nine, you know? I felt sometimes if a person's really spiritually in touch, you know that something big is happening and that Shim's going to, you know, and it was just all, it was just like, I felt this. I remember going back to the apartment because it's just before we were going to leave and go back to Seattle. And I opened up my email and I have an email from the White House inviting me to come to this from the President uh, Obama and the First Lady. They invite you to come to the White House for Hanukkah. It was a Hanukkah invite. And now I'm thinking, the first thing I'm thinking is that this is mom's a prank. I know it's a prank because Yosef, five minutes ago, my brother-in-law, who walked out, he just pranked me, texted me from our unmarked number. I didn't know what the number was. And he told me, oh, my kids love your music. They paint themselves in chocolate and they run around the house. You know, like, he just, and I found out whatever he did. And then shortly after this, I get this email. So I'm like, okay, he's, he's, he, the guy won't stop. So I called the number on there and it's the White House. So... I call back to my friend, I tell him, you have to call Rav Arush, I couldn't speak in Hebrew at the time, I couldn't talk, talk to Rav Arush. I said, Rav, you have to tell him, Rav Arush, I, I, have a, I have an invite from the White House, what am I gonna do? Do I, what, what, you know, I'm thinking, like, I'm excited, but what do I do? I wanna ask the rabbi. And of course, now I think about it, I'm so close to the Rav, of course, it was like, to him, it was a no-brainer, you gotta go give Obama the Garden of Amuna. So, yeah, he sent me on Shlichut to go give Barack Obama. He sent me Hafatza, 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 you gotta do, okay, book So, I'm sorry, sure, I ended up going, right? And, and before I get there, that's a whole nother story, but I, I, at least when I got there, it was all by Hashem's design, right? I just, like I said, I'm just flying. I got back from here to Israel, and I'm like, you know what I'm saying? I'm feeling so good about everything. I have Rav Arush, and, and I'm in this place, Silver Spring. And the friend that I'm with, all of a sudden his foot is just like swollen. It's like, it's huge. And he, he can't walk that far. So I'm like trying to figure out. And when in doubt, like, we need a suda. The people we're staying with, they're not making a suda Friday night. They said, we can eat by them Saturday, but on Friday night, they're not making a suda. So what are we going to do? We need to find a place. So I had two things. First thing I did, I called my Rebbe, Rabbi Shmuel Brody, who was in Seattle. And I told him, I said, listen, we need a place. You're from Silver Spring. Rebbe, can you please help me find a place maybe somewhere to eat on Friday night? So he says to me, I'll call you back. And he hangs up. And so I'm waiting. Time is waiting. It's getting closer to Shabbos. And when in doubt, call Chabad. So I called the Chabad rabbi. And I told him, I said, listen, we're here. We're our guests, our host here. And not having a suit on Friday night. So we need a place to go. And he said, oh, sure, of course. And the door opened. And like right after I hung up the phone, my rabbi called me back. I said, I have the place for you. This is the place. It's the I was like, Rebbe, I already, I already called the Chabad. I didn't know. I didn't hear back from you or whatever. And the phone just gets dead silent. And he goes, he says, don't do this to me. And I'm like, okay. You know what I'm saying? So after he tells me where the place is, so I said, this is the only thing I could do. And I brought the Rebbe. I said, at least I'm going to Google map it. And this guy's foot hurts and he can't walk far. So whichever place is closer, I'm going to go. So I happened to be that the place that my Rebbe said was closer. 
So I went to this place. I went there, went down it, and the first thing I see on the book is a Breslov book by Seventh Heaven by Rabbi Kramer. So I grabbed this book and I'm reading through it or whatever. And I had already dabbled in Mincha early, so everybody's starting to dab in there, and, and it's quiet, it's completely quiet. There's a guy next to me, I didn't even look at him, my head's down, I'm reading the book, whatever. And he goes, psst, psst, dead silent, okay? If anybody hears anything, it's just, you know what I'm saying? Nobody can talk inside this place, you understand? So him going, psst, psst, sounds like a bomb, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm looking at it, and he goes, you know, I just very much, I didn't look at his face, so I just kind of like look in his direction. I go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he goes, is this your book? And I, and I go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he goes, where'd you get it? And I said, you know, from back there. So it's quiet again. And then all of a sudden, psst, psst. <laughs> I think, oh my goodness, this guy's just like choosing the wrong time, you know. For the... Then he goes, are you niecing? And I just, uh, mm -hmm. I saw it's quiet again. He goes, psst, psst, I'm Laser Brody's brother. And I look at him, and he looks just like Rabbi Laser Brody. He's got the shrimel, the beard. He, look, he looks just like Rabbi Brody. And I just like gave him the biggest hug, you know. So after we were done davening, he sat me down. He said, every day after davening, I learned from like Temara. He said, this is what I learned. Every day after Davin, I learned Lekote Maran. And where he was in Lekote Maran happened to be Torah Gimel, which is the Torah Rabbi Nachman uses, he speaks about kosher musicians. When he speaks about music, he goes into the idea of music. And like, that's my whole thing. And we sat there and we learned that Torah and I was flying after, after that Torah. And I remember going out in Silver Spring. They had a beautiful place for Hebrew to do it. Beautiful place for Hebrew to do it. And I said, he'd kashrut, and I, and for the first time, you know, like, I'm just like in the snow, two hours in the snow. I'm being honest with you. I felt like it was five minutes. And I remember after I got back home, I stayed in touch with this guy, and he kept on hounding me on that. You got to go to Uman. You got to go to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. You got to go to Uman, you know, whatever. So I went to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, and I'm telling you, I came back with so much light, so much, so much awe. And my wife, she said to me, listen, does this mean that we're Bresla? And I said... <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what this means. So, Baruch Hashem, that's my story, how I, came, how I came to Breslau. By the way, Obama did get the Garden of Amuna. I don't think he re read it, obviously. I think it's pretty obvious he didn't read it. But he did get, he did get the book, Baruch Hashem. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Brooklyn should stop being exposed to it. That's the first thing. <laughs> but the 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 truth is is that there's a lot of things that's, that's happening right now that the you know to some degree there's that that battle and it's mamish is we're in a time where there's tug of war for the shamas, you know. And and as much as we all like to, you know, seal ourselves off, you know, and we like to get away in a place to where we can like cut the kids off and we, we can't really do it. So the, the, the main thing is that I've always seen are things that I've, that I've been able to glean from not only Rav Arush but from other, other tzaddikim and other upright people in our generation that, that begin to speak on the, the idea of chinook and education is, is that, is that you, you have to be that fire. That the children are only, they can only they can only, you can only give what you live, right? So that for us, we have to, we have to be there for ourselves. I know for, for my kids personally, you know, for a long time, me and my wife, at least we felt the need and I, I think it was a big help and I think even now we, we kept on to this, but to some degree in, in very small, small places, but anything like for my children that they can't, that I can't, they can't watch, I don't watch. Anything that I don't want them listening to, I don't listen to. So the, these type of things, is, you know, to some degree, it could be a hard restriction, but we have to understand, you know, it would be very, very hard to raise the next Gadole Ador, you know, if, look at we talking during shul, or, you know, I'm saying those type of things, it's very, very difficult. So I think the, the education in itself, it starts with us, and then later on, we'll give it off and it be authentic, because kids read through everything. You know, but they, they read through everything, and they're so real, the neshamas are so real, they're so, it's just emes. 
And so anything that's fake or it's not authentic or it's us just putting on a show for them, they're not, they, they, they wouldn't be. So I think my, my personal opinion is it, it starts with us that once we're strong in something, then we, we can educate without even having to say many words. That's my, that's my opinion. Okay. My family's reaction to the conversion. You know, this thing happened like a stage. At first, they thought I was crazy. Then they thought I was in a cult. And then, you know, like, this thing swings. I think now I've landed at the place where they're just very proud of me, you know? Not because they understand anything really about Judaism. Um, but it's not only for my family, friends, and different things like that. They see a total transformation of a person. And they see <clears throat> a person that they see and they understand that unhealthy lifestyle I escaped from it. So... I think right now, from, from what I've gathered over talking to certain family members, which I don't speak too much, not enough, obviously, but uh, is that they're very, very proud of me. Very, very proud of me. So, um, music is a very powerful co-op. Yeah. Um, and um, I wanted to, if you can please describe, besides for the obvious differences between what I imagine your music was in your prior life and music now, mm -hmm. but more about... Do you, can you describe some of the differences in terms of how you compose and what your goals are yeah. and how you invest your kishkas and your music mm. now? And you right. What are the differences in right. your music? One of the biggest differences is that today I'm much more, I'm less connected to music as an item. Like, I don't like, you know, for instance, People say to you all the time, it's just like only by, by athletes and maybe by anybody that's in, involved in like entertainment, maybe music or by athletes, where everybody just all of a sudden, if that's your profession, like do it for me right now in the street corner. You know what I'm saying? Like, can you rap for me? You know what I mean? Like, that's the only like, can you do that? Yeah. And it's not just a thing where it's like, you know, okay, I'm professional. It's just, I'm not connected with it like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not connected with it. I've seen it as a tool to be able to affect the shamans. And so I got back into it, you know? It wasn't a thing for me where I felt like, you know, I just can't live without music. Because I, like, I was doing it and I was happy without, without, without being involved in music. And when I realized that this is something that Hashim wanted me to do and that this was going to be a, a clue for me to be able to affect people, you know, I, I, I grabbed onto it. Because I'm connected with what I use it for rather than it in itself. Back in the day, it was much more, I was connected to music in itself. Like I would listen to, you know, I don't even listen to music really that much, but when I do, for sure, it's not rap. I haven't heard rap in maybe eight, ten years maybe. I haven't listened to it at all. So I don't know who's hot, who's not, who's why, and what, because. So I'm very disconnected with it as a genre or, or with music, you know, as, as an item in itself. And I only see it as a tool. When I use music today, even though some of the music I do listen to, I'm using it during my Hizboda disorder. It's helping me to get myself, you know, uh, ready to learn or doing that. So I'm using music and, and, I, and I view it much more as a tool rather than an item, it being the in all of it of itself, if that makes any sense. Yeah. How, how, that's a good question. How does the song fly away? What does it make you there to make that song? What does it make this song? I, the, the song Fly Away, Yosef's not in here, maybe he flew away. Um, <laughs> Yosef actually composed that song and he wrote the chorus and he sneaks around, he's hiding around it somewhere maybe. But, uh, and it was pre presented to me and I, and I love the song. So automatically that even though he may have created it or composed the music and then he had the chorus at least sitting there and it was open for me to write the raps and we worked I think maybe a, a little bit on it afterwards and maybe another producer did. But, so when I'm sitting there with that song, I have to start sort of like give it meaning, you know, same thing with A Million Years, also to Yosef Kapoza. Like I'm sitting there thinking I have to give it, you know, what is, what is not letting it go in a million years mean for me? Or what does it mean to fly away to me? And so that song in and of itself is really disconnected from the video. Most people think like it's an amazing thing, like it matches. But what I'm actually talking about in that song is flying away to the me, the, the flying away to the true me. And I say it if anybody pays attention to the lyrics, where am I flying away to? I flew away to me, to the real me. Because the, the Bill Bobby, he says, Ravi Tamar Schwartz, he has a section, a pamphlet on Bitochon that I, that I read on Bitochon. He says that inside the person is the makor for true Bitochon, true faith and true security as inside the person. A certain akuda that a person may neglect and he may think that he's all 
all these things, but it has nothing to do with who the core of the person is. And in that place, a person can receive true Menuchas Nefesh, he can have true Yeshubadat, he can be so far and distant away from all the world and all of its worries and everything else, but that place is not somewhere external, it's inside the person. So I took that concept and I wrote a song about it. Yeah. What's the Hashem. I think the Musar and the lessons from, from my story is that the Icar is, 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 is no different than, I always say that like, you know, you know, when you, if you've ever been to Oman, you see the 40,000 people. So it's really always one story of each person that either came and found Rabbi Nachman's teachings or things like that. It's just that, Mama Shiva, it's no pun here, but even in a dark place, you know, even in a place where it's completely far. You can find the Shem, and the Shem is found in every single place, you know? And the, and the Ikra is for me that anything, you know, Rav Nassim says, Rav Abraham and Rav Nachman has a safer called Chuk Ve'or, that I'm zoking to learn with Rav Nassim Maimon every single day, Boka Shem, and Michael's setting up even in person or out of person for some of those classes or whatever. One of the things that he says that Rav Nassim says is that he says, I wouldn't believe it. He said, I wouldn't believe it from the biggest kofar in the word world. He could be a person to say his far, his words can be very, very far from that emis. He could say that he doesn't believe in Hashem and he could say the worst things in the world. He says, I won't believe it. I won't believe that there's not a point inside of every single Jew that wants Hashem, Mama. She just wants Hashem and it wants to cling to Hashem. And that person, that 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 Nakut is inside every single person. And so the whole Voda is, like I said, at the beginning of the Shi'ur, the Reb Nachman says that we have an obligation to go and look for the, the what we lost in this world. It's that whole Nakuda of Emma's the true me. Who am I at my at my source and at my core? I'm a Jew. And they ask Yona, who, who are you? What's your profession? What that? He said, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. To get to that point. And what is a Jew? A Jew is a praises Hashem, wants to be close to Hashem. We are the fire. We are Hashem's hands in this world. And so that idea of the Vekas, that the Ramchal says that this is the whole entire purpose of us being in this, is to get to Olam Abba. But what is that? We need to, this is the corridor to the next world. And what's the Ikka? It's the Vekas, to be bound up with the Shem Mamash, to be bound up with the Shem. And that, that want of its own, the Kisufim, that we all, it's inside every single Jew. And the whole vote is to dust off and get rid of all the schmutz, everything that's covering it up. But it's inside of every single person. So when Nasser says it, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So even furthermore, I could tell you my whole story, like I just did now, and tell you how far away I was away from Hashem, that all of a sudden something was inside, and I, and I found Hashem. And I found Hashem. So you mean to tell me a person that was born a Jew, he, he all of a sudden, for him, no, Hashem... Still, I don't believe it. Just like Rav Nassim, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Okay. Picking up on what you just said, uh, there are a lot of entertainers, very big people who are Jewish, mm -hmm. and they're nowhere near as close to the Judaism as you are. Mm -hmm. Have you had any interactions with any of them that maybe there could yeah. be a little dent on their consciousness so they can use their... Well, some guys, or some guys, some guys I've met, I can't say... But then, you know, one of the things is that, I mean, a lot of us are always together at different functions and different different things like that. The guys that are a little bit closer, the guys that are more distant, that, you know, that are bigger. I've been around some of the guys, you know. And it's very, very hard to, like I said, on the surface to see that these things are in there. But it doesn't take away the fact that, that you have the Muna. One kid, I was away a few Shabbos ago, my brother-in-law. And just before we left, so before we left... Maybe a week or whatever. We went to go do a Shabbaton by Yeshiva in, in Israel, Reishi. And one of the boys came up to us and he said something that was just like, you know, I almost want to cry on the spot because he went into so much depth. But he said that, listen, even if you would have never said anything, he said, the fact that you're just here and to see you in the base midrash and to see you on ground is, is such a kiddush, a shim, and you don't know. I mamish want to kiss the ground. You understand what I'm saying where you are? Because it gives me, you know, just without saying anything. So after that, it made me think about all the time. So we don't know what we're doing. We think that it's just something, you know how many stories it was that a person made true, but just because they just seen a Jew. They seen a Jew that looked like a Jew, and they could tell. And all of a sudden, some start to wake up inside. So sometimes, uh, you know, giving the Musar directly or whatever is not going to really help. It's just being there in the place with Hashem's help. I wish that just by being there and, and having that connection to Hashem, you can always... You know, wake up, wake up the hidden spark inside somebody else with the shim. So, so you have time for a question?
Shkoya. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much, everybody. If you haven't gotten a ticket for the concert on Sunday, you can still go ahead in the front, get yourself a ticket. Sunday night concert, Nisim Black, Penny Schachter. <laughs> Sunday night, guys. We'll all see you there. Thank you for watching. We love you all.